All of us at the Howen Stein Center are so grateful for the opportunity we have to share world-class public programs time and again with the West Michigan community. But we recognize that our work would not be possible without the commitment of our truly outstanding supporters, including the partnership organizations with whom we collaborate. To Joe and Donna Calvaruso and the board of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation, we thank you for everything you do to ensure that civic education thrives in Grand Rapids and beyond. It's an honor to work with you. Let's have a round of applause. We also benefit from the partnership of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum. In the words of our director, Gleaves Whitney, ours is the best partnership in the country between a presidential study center and a facility of the National Archives and Records Administration. I might add that this partnership will only continue to get better when the federal government shutdown ends in just a few more years. <laughs> Hang in there. We look forward to our library and museum colleagues joining us again soon. There are so many distinguished West Michigan leaders in the audience today. As a Grand Valley alumnus myself, I'd like to thank the elected officials who have made time to be here this afternoon, as well as members of the Grand Valley Board of Trustees, GVSU President Tom and Marsha Haas, President Emeritus Mark Murray, President Emeritus Don and Nancy Lubbers, members of the Grand Valley Senior Management Team, and members of the Howenstein Center Executive Board and Advisory Cabinet. Let's have one more clap. I have just two quick updates before we proceed with our program today. Books are available for sale after the presentation, but please know that the author will not be available to sign them. We'll be handling Q&A on note cards this afternoon, which were available as you walked into the venue today. If you didn't get one, don't worry. We have Howenstein Center volunteers who will be walking up and down the aisles throughout the programs today, and they can give you one. As soon as you have a question that comes to mind, just raise that note card in the air, and one of our volunteers will come and get it from you. In closing, I'm happy to inform you that it is our proud custom at Howenstein Center Events to introduce one of the center's exemplary Peter C. Cook Leadership Academy Fellows for a few remarks on what the Howenstein Center has meant to them. As many of you already know, we call this segment the Leadership Minute. Tonight's Leadership Minute will be given by Jamie Fleury. Please help me give a warm welcome to Jamie. My name is Jamie Fleury, and I'm a second year fellow in the Cook Leadership Academy. I'm also pursuing two degrees in legal studies and multimedia journalism. I grew up in Kalamazoo with two incredible parents as role models, both public servants in their own right. My father, a police officer, and my mother, a city manager, both taught me the value of education and hard work, instilling within me the idea that leaders are those who make the world better by applying their unique talents and service to it. With hopes of tapping into my own potential, I applied to the Cook Leadership Academy. Known and respected for its ability to connect students with mentors, the Academy fosters a community of dedicated leaders who strive for excellence and growth above all. The program pulls together students from more than 50 different disciplines, thereby encouraging diversity and bipartisanship. The mentor and advisors I've connected with, the courses I took in Washington, DC, the wheelhouse talks and events like this one have molded me into a more empathetic and open-minded individual. More importantly, the Academy has helped me realize that common ground is possible when leaders step up and reach across the aisle in order to pursue the common good. In the future, I plan to earn an advanced degree relevant to my interests in law, government, and the nonprofit sector. But no matter where I end up, I know I'm better prepared to excel thanks to the Cook Leadership Academy. My name is Jamie Fleury, and I'm a leader. Thank you. Way to go, Jamie. Great job. You do us proud. Well, I'm Gleaves Whitney, director of the Hallenstein Center for Presidential Studies here at Grand Valley State University. And I am pleased to welcome you, and I have the very pleasant duty of introducing our speaker. But first, I want to point out that today is the third anniversary of Ralph Hallenstein's passing. And as you know, uh, Ralph is our hero. He's a hero and a mentor, I think, to many of the people in this room. Uh, he certainly provided us with the North 
star by which we calibrate our compass. And so Ralph's memory will continue to live on with us and I hope with you as well. So uh, let's just remember Ralph today while we're listening to John Meacham. Now, for generations, there has been the quest to write something called the Great American Novel. And there's been a parallel quest, I think, to write the Great American History. The idea is, how do you get America right? What is the essence? And I think we all have books that come to mind when we think of such projects. I think some people are going to think of Tocqueville, Democracy in America. I see Annette Kirk. Others are going to think of Russell Kirk and uh, the roots of American order, perhaps. Um, and without flattering the author, I do think that the soul of America belongs in that genre of how to understand America. What is the essence of our country? John's work is sermonic. He gets it right. He shows how past generations of Americans have thrown themselves into the battle of stark polarities, polarities like good and evil, justice and racism, hope and cynicism, truth and lies, wheat and tares. Always it's the perennial struggle for our better angels to prevail. Past generations have also had to recognize that there are many good polarities, good contradictions that we have to struggle with. Think of liberty and equality, justice and mercy, nature and industry, individual rights and community needs. This too is a perennial challenge for us Americans. Well, ever since the quest for the material betterment at Jamestown has been contrasted with the quest for spiritual betterment that you see at Plymouth, Americans have defined themselves in terms of these polarities. And they've struggled in what Theodore Roosevelt called the arena. And what makes the arena really interesting is that that's where the American soul reveals itself. John's book urges us to get into the arena, exercise our civic muscle, and do what we can to shape the American soul, not just let it reflect us. He urges us to get into that arena with an attitude. It's what I love about this book, a big attitude. Hasn't America been large enough, both for the secular enlightenment and for the religious great awakening? Hasn't the American idea generated enough, both to respond to the promise of equality in the Declaration and the premise of liberty in the Constitution? Shouldn't Americans value the rights both of the individual and the needs of our communities? And aren't we a better nation when we wrestle with a dynamic tension, a creative tension really, between innovative reform and conservative renewal? Ladies and gentlemen, John Meacham holds a mirror up to our souls, challenging us, imploring us to live by our better angels. The vocation of citizenship means to be fierce when we have to be. I think, for example, of Franklin Roosevelt battling evil in the Third Reich. Fierce when we have to be, but also tolerant of the rough and tumble of democracy, the to and fro of the many diverse ideas here at home. I think of George H.W. Bush urging us to be kinder and gentler as Americans. And of course, Bush is reflecting a tradition from Abraham Lincoln, urging us to be friends and not enemies. And that's, of course, one of the things we are so committed to because of Ralph Hauenstein here at the Hauenstein Center. Jamie's talking about it at the Cook Leadership Academy. How to exercise that civic friendship, that civic muscle, so that we are friends and not enemies when we speak to one another about our soul and this democracy. You know, looking out from this podium, I think I see three generations of Americans, generations that have made a difference, whose vocations of citizens have breathed life and energy into our public square. Three generations of Americans who hopefully have inspired people like Jamie and her generation to continue the awesome burden of leadership and citizenship in our democracy. We have John Meacham here today with us to tell us more about what that awesome burden entails. Please join me in giving John Meacham a warm Michigan welcome.
It's, um... Thank you. It's uh, really all downhill from here. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, no, that's amazing. Thank you. Uh, I didn't think Gleas could beat Jamie, but, uh, and he didn't. Uh, but um, came damn close. Um, I, I really, uh, I've never been introduced quite so well and so, uh, so favorably, including actually chiefly in my own house, uh, where I make the children read aloud from the book at breakfast every morning. Uh, you can imagine how normal they are. Um, uh, it's, it's always a thrill to be here. Uh, I'm a, a great admirer of, uh, of President Ford, um, and I'm delighted to be here on a, a sacred day uh, because of uh, your founder. And uh, Ms. Kirk uh, hosted me a thousand years ago, or 750, uh, uh, in Macosta, uh, where Russell Kirk managed to combine in a single conversation T.S. Eliot, Anthony Trollope, and Jen. And I thought, <laughs> this is a man I can do business with uh, at, at any point. Um, very generous words. I, I want to quickly tell you a story, because I was sitting there thinking, yes, I am all those things. Uh, sermonic was my favorite. Uh, I love that. Not harmonic, but sermonic. Uh, uh, so 12, no, 11 years ago now on the Washington Mall, I was at the National Book Festival, and I told the story at Barbara Bush's funeral, but it's, it's absolutely true and bears repeating. A woman ran up to me, which doesn't happen enough, <laughs> and said, oh my God, it's you. And I said, well, yes. You know, it's, existentially speaking, that's hard to argue with. And this may be the one place in Western Michigan where I can use existential as an adverb. That's good. Uh, in Tennessee, we can't use it anywhere, uh, so, so that's good. Um, I married a Mississippian. That's the only sense in which she married up, was marrying at, at Tennessee. And we had hardback books. They didn't have those. Anyway. Um, anyway. So I was on my way at that point to give my talk about Andrew Jackson. And she says, I, I just love your books. They've meant so much to me. I'm going to go buy your latest one. Will you wait right here and sign it? And I said, yes, ma'am. And I thought, this is exactly the way the world is supposed to be. Women are supposed to run up to you. They're supposed to buy your book. This is perfect. Hand to God, she brought back John Grisham's latest novel. <laughs> so, totally true story. So... So whenever I think I'm sermonic, uh, I remind myself that there's a woman somewhere in America with a forged copy of The Runaway Jury. So but you have to sign it, right? I mean, what are you going to do? So I swear to God, this is true. The next day, this is also true. I was on my, at that point, I was writing the book about President Bush. It was supposed to be posthumous, uh, but until recently, he just wouldn't die. Uh, and I was... Uh, up there on a Sunday in Maine, and I tell this story, and I'll be honest, I was totally fishing for motherly reassurance from Barbara Bush. And so I said, you know, I was mistaken for John Grisham, and Barbara Bush, in that inimitable way, looked across the table and said, well, how do you think poor John Grisham would feel? You know, <laughs> no, it's worse. He's a very handsome man. <laughs> Bad weekend. Bad weekend. You'll have those, Jamie. Fight through it, all right? <laughs> Fight through it. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, not necessarily this particular moment, uh, because I don't know, I have no light to shed, uh, particularly. Uh, I think it is remarkably divisive, but it, it is not unprecedented uh, in its scope. There are many people here who have lived through remarkable periods of existential crisis in American life. And I think that Samuel Taylor Coleridge was almost right. Uh, he talked about history being a lantern on the stern by which we can see how we got to a certain place by once we've gone through the ocean. I actually think it needs to be on the bow. It needs, it, you know, we, we need to find a way to use the past to look forward not necessarily as a historical GPS or a how-to book. It's not as though you can say, all right, I want a better civic culture, so what are the three things you do? But it is a diagnostic guide. 
history, it does enable us to say, is there a condition that recurs, and what can we do to try to make our best guess about how to solve that? I'm fascinated by the fact that so much, and it's now intuitive, so much of our political conversation is based on the vernacular of health, the body politic. We avoid corruption. The original meaning of the word corruption was not graft, but disease. The idea of a uh, crisis, Hippocrates popularized that. Crisis meant moment of decision in a medical condition. It was a moment by which the patient either survived or died. And so, which the people who write the captions on cable news don't have a great appreciation of the Hippocratic uh, language of that. Uh, but it's, it's a sign of both in the ancient world all the way through the American founding of how vital our public life was seen to our private life. They weren't separate spheres. They weren't something you could divide easily. They had a porous border, no wall. Um, sorry. It took six minutes to get to a joke, so that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Uh, so where I, I think we have to think about the, the vitality, the centrality of, of our public life, but we have to think about it proportionately. And that's why I wrote the book uh, that, that came out uh, on VE Day uh, this last year. It was not an attempt to say, we have been here before, so relax. But it was an attempt to say, we've been here before, and we have to do all we can to understand where we put the problems of the present in the relative scales of gravity. How, how bad is this? Now, I am not a partisan. I have voted for Democrats. I have voted for Republicans. As I said, I'm from Tennessee, so it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, you all matter. I don't. Uh, I've lived in New York and Tennessee. My vote has never mattered uh, in, in, in my adult life. But if you voted for the incumbent president two years ago, you were saying that you believed things were so bad that, and in fact the possibilities of their getting worse were so disturbing, that you were willing to send the most unconventional major party nominee in American history to the pinnacle of power. That's not a partisan point. He'll tell you that at some length. Um, that's redundant. Uh, but if you voted against the incumbent, so therefore, so therefore, if you voted for him, you were desperately unhappy with either the way things had been going under President Obama or the way you feared things might go under a President Clinton. It was less an affirmative vote than a desperate one. If you voted, so therefore you weren't, you weren't happy if you voted for him. If you voted against him, let's be honest, you've set your hair on fire three times today. <laughs> so we have this Hobbesian moment. It is the war of all against all. It is a constant shifting struggle. It reminds me of Lexington and Concord which was one of the first great unconventional battles. One of our first, bat our first battle, obviously, but the, the, there was no front line. It was a rolling, chaotic, guerrilla battle through that part of Massachusetts. That's the way our politics is now. If we solve this whole wall thing, border security, whatever you want to call it, within six hours, and I'm being generous, there'll be something else. Partly because it's our nature, but also partly because the president has an explicit strategy to perpetuate conflict. He has said this. He has said that he wants to treat every day of his presidency as an episode in a television series where he, in which he vanquishes his rivals. This is not an observation. I am reporting this. So it's exhausting. It's depleting to some extent. My argument is we have to do all we can to resist that exhaustion and to resist that depletion 
because the ultimate experiment, the ultimate search for a more perfect union, not a perfect one, perfection is not possible on this side of paradise, is so vital. And if we act as though the problems of this particular moment are unprecedented, or they've never been worse, we do two things that are worth avoiding. One is we foreclose the possibility of learning from the past, because if everything was easier somehow, why would we study it? Why would we look back? Because they had it in a simpler way. As my friend David McCullough likes to say, no one walked around in the past saying, my, the past is very interesting. <laughs> no. There's never been a moment in the history of the world since the first chapter of Genesis where people have said, you know what, everything's great, I hope nothing ever changes. This doesn't work that way. Everything's a struggle, everything. Sometimes it's to a greater degree, sometimes less, sometimes it's more immediate to us, sometimes it's a little more distant, but this is the nature of reality, it's the nature of life in a fallen world. The second thing that I think is worth avoiding there, if we act as though everything was simpler, were simpler, is we don't do justice to the people who brought us here, to this moment and to this hour, to have something worth defending. We don't do justice to the men who, boys, who stormed the beach of Normandy, or to Rosa Parks who wouldn't get up. Pick your example. There, Blessedly, there are an inf infinite number of examples of people whose names we may not know who have said that they wanted the country to be a place where our better angels have an opportunity to prevail. There's nothing guaranteed about the fact of their prevailing. I might remember the moment when Lincoln used that term. It was March 4th, 1861, when the country was genuinely falling apart. And he said he hoped that one day the better angels of our nature would reassert themselves. And that's the hope that keeps us going. So <clears throat> some thoughts about, uh, I'm going to stick, uncharacteristically, I'm going to stick in the last hundred years or so. Um, so this is very current. This is like Dick Clark for me. Um, <laughs> you don't get Dick Clark thrown at you on many Thursday mornings, uh, I hope. Uh, if we had been here exactly 100 years ago, in uh, 1919, here's what would have been going on. We would have just finished the First World War. Civil liberties had been terribly attacked and curbed under President Wilson. President Wilson had just resegregated the federal government. The Ku Klux Klan had been refounded four years ago in 1915 on Stone Mountain, Georgia. Anti-Catholic, anti-Semitic, anti-black. It was reaching a strength of three to five million Americans, 17 senators, 70 members of the House, the governors of Colorado, Oregon, Indiana, Texas, and Georgia were members of the Klan. It was an extraordinary national movement. The 1924 Democratic National Convention went to 103 ballots because there were 327 Klan delegates in the in Madison Square Garden who would not vote for this wild radical Al Smith. That was a radical then. Uh, Irish Catholic governor of New York. Anti-Catholicism was a motive force in the anti-immigrant sentiment of the time. That same year, 1924, the governor of Georgia, Clifford Walker, gave a speech in Kansas City at an annual meeting of the Klan saying that we should build a wall of steel as high as heaven to keep out Southern Europeans who had never thought or believed in democracy. So I know that some of you all think that Fox or MSNBC started all this. <laughs> what had been going on in that period to drive this? Extraordinary stress created by the transition between an agrarian and industrial economy. 1920 was the year of the census first, first saw that a majority of Americans lived in cities, not in rural areas. There was the rise of a national culture, which began to 
disorient many people. Think about it. Before you bought a radio, which were widely commercially available in 1921, you basically, if you were a householder, if you were out here, if you were in, in my part of the world, you pretty much controlled everything that came into your house. Your kid might get a library book that you might not know about, but you knew which papers to which you subscribed. You knew what books you bought. You knew what church you went to. You knew what revival you might attend. My favorite story about revivals, by the way, is there was uh, in Tom Sawyer, there was a preacher who came to town, Tom Sawyer said, who was so good that even Huck Finn was saved until Monday. <laughs> Just a great line. <laughs> So you, you controlled your universe, really up until about 1919. So let's say you're a farmer, you're squeezed out because of an industrialization, heading into 1921, 22. Your world is uprooted. Suddenly there's this machine in the hallway, in the living room, in the parlor, where people in these foreign places called Hollywood and New York are sending culture into your house, these ideas you can't control, and you have to now move to a city. Suddenly you're in a city, and there are a bunch of people who don't really look like people you're used to. It's the dislocation. It's, it's, it's the same forces that we're seeing now. And it was virulent at the time. And the second Ku Klux Klan was a manifestation of those anxieties. My own view of the, of the incumbent president is that he is the most vivid manifestation we've ever sent to the pinnacle of power of many of the least attractive characteristics in our national character. They are perennial characteristics, and they will always be perennial characteristics. I call this the soul of America in part because soul in Hebrew and in Greek means breath or life. So when God breathes life into man in Genesis, that word can be translated as soul. When Jesus says, uh, greater love have no man than this than to lay down his life for his friends, life can be translated as soul. So it's an essence. It's a breath. It's an ongoing thing. It drives me crazy when people say about whatever outrage, or whichever side of the aisle you're on, that's not who we are. That's not the soul of the country. The hell it's not. <laughs> right? In my native region, 55 years ago, we excluded people from the ballot box in direct violation of the Constitution of the United States. A hundred years ago, women couldn't vote. You all have not yet voted for a century. Four years ago, wherever you stand on this issue, the Supreme Court of the United States decided that marriage equality in a civic sense, in a civil sense, was a justification. That was four years ago. I've never heard a, in, in, there's a lot of rapid movement on attitudes, particularly among young folks, about sexual identity and, the, and how that should be represented at the public square. And people say, people like me say, you know, that opinion's changing so rapidly. I've never heard a single non-traditional sexually identified person say, boy, things are changing so rapidly. It's like you never heard, you didn't hear many African Americans in 1966 say, boy, things really happened fast for us. <laughs> Did you? No, you didn't. So one of the things we have to think about is in, our, in this national soul, seems to me one way to think about the country, and I offer this for what it's worth, is it's not all good, it's not all bad. It is a struggle between our, those better angels and our worst instincts. And it's not exactly a radical view because that's what James Madison and Alexander Hamilton, by the way, I'm a Jefferson biographer. Um, if any of you have rap lyrics about Thomas Jefferson, <laughs> meet me afterward because I'm trying Totally parenthetical story. Um, so in 2012, I published the book on Jefferson, and I got a call from Chris Christie. It's before he became Patty Hearst. And um, 
And, and he said, I want to talk to you about Thomas Jefferson. Will you come see him? And Christie's great company. He's, he's hilarious. And so I went to Trenton. He was governor then. And we sit down. And I really wasn't thinking. Uh, and he says, well, you know, I'm really more of a Hamilton guy. Well, that usually means you're an investment banker. That's what that means. <laughs> and without thinking, I said, well, that's great, governor. But, you know, <laughs> at least my guy didn't get shot in Jersey. <laughs> and... <laughs> The damnedest thing happened. I couldn't get back into the city. All the, <laughs> all the bridges were closed. Um, there's a second story there quickly. Uh, and the list of stupid things I've said to governors. Um, when George W. Bush was running for president, uh, 98, 99, he ran a kind of William McKinley campaign where he had people come down to Austin and see him. And I went down. I was a journalist then. And he found out I was from Tennessee, and he said, you know, hey, you know, you know, y'all were really important in the Texas Revolution. I said, yeah, you know, actually, Governor, if, if it weren't for us, you know, y'all would still be part of Spain. And he went, that's pretty funny, asshole. asshole. <laughs> um, so that's the key to him, is you do this. Um, one more totally parenthetical. So, the sweetest thing happened to him recently. Um, he had, uh, W had uh, Will Ferrell, remember, who played him so well on Saturday Night Live, and uh, Lauren Michaels, the architect of Saturday Night Live, the producer, come down to the library, which I thought was kind of generous. You know, have him come down, talk about satire. I see you have Bill Brands coming to talk about presidents and humor. It's, it's a great way of, of thinking about it. And um, so they're standing out, they're standing Bush is standing with Farrell and, and Michaels right before they go out to the event. And Bush says, yeah, I kind of made this easy for you guys. And they say, what do you mean? He said, well, I gave you strategery. <laughs> um, and they look at each other. Stick with it. So Farrell, and they say, should we tell him? And they said, you know, Mr. President, we made that up. <laughs> and Bush was crushed. He said, yeah, but I gave you misunderestimated. <laughs> anyway, um, back to the soul of America. Um, we do have this essence that is Jefferson and Hamilton, and it's Lincoln and Davis, and it's uh, Wallace and uh, Kennedy and King. And you have a soul that has room for the Klan, and it has room for Martin Luther King. And when you think about it, the struggle of every moment, because this is true for us, right, individually, so why wouldn't it be true in a republic, which is the sum of our parts? A republic is the manifestation of the dispositions of heart and mind of all of us. It's the nature of self-government. It's an idea Plato understood it. It came through Augustine and Aquinas to Machiavelli to Madison to all of us. We are, in fact, the country is, in fact, far more representative of us than we might want to acknowledge. Politicians are far more often mirrors of who we are than they are molders. That's a hard truth, but think about it. If, 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 they, if we wanted something different, don't you think they would do it? They're like rats, you know, with the thing. Not that we, public service is very important, uh, <laughs> but they really are. Uh, you know, it's, it's a reactive system. That's why moments of leadership we talk about so specifically and so often, it's because they're so few and far between. You don't always get a Gerald Ford. You don't always get a Dwight Eisenhower. You don't always get a Ronald Reagan, or in my view, a George Herbert Walker Bush. You don't always have these heroic moments which makes them heroic. If they were common, we wouldn't think of them as heroic. You wouldn't commemorate them. You wouldn't want to emulate them. Jack Kennedy once said, there's a reason Profiles and Courage was one volume. <laughs> I'll wait, that's funny. <laughs> so we, we, we have to find a way to understand that this is a human struggle. Our politics, our government, our public life is a human struggle. But that is actually, I think, quite liberating because it means that we can change it. We won't change it perfectly or forever because nothing will be changed perfectly and forever 
you know, short of what Faulkner called the last red and dying evening. But the soul of the country ultimately has created moments where a, a culture where what is the immigration issue in this country? It's that people want to come here. They're not leaving. They're coming here. And we can argue and will for the next year about the nuances and details of that. But fundamentally, do people want to be part of this experiment or not? And more people want to be part of it than not. And so there is something worth preserving. There is something worth refining. And it will go on and be a struggle from moment to moment to moment. So that was 100 years ago. 1933, Franklin Roosevelt becomes president on the 4th of March. He gives an inaugural address on the east front of the Capitol. The line we all remember is the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. I think partly remember that because the line is alluded to on the first page of To Kill a Mockingbird. <laughs> remember, that, that's how Ms. Lee grounds the story. She says that Maycomb had just been told that it had nothing to fear but fear itself. So you know it's 1933. The line that got the biggest cheer that day was not that one. It was when Roosevelt said that the current crisis was of such scope and magnitude that he might require wartime-like executive powers in order to govern as if we had been invaded by a foreign foe. And the crowd roared. Eleanor Roosevelt wrote that night in her diary that she was chilled to the bone because it suggested that the people might be ready for a dictator. And remember where we were in the 1932-33. There was a live question about whether democratic capitalism would survive the decade. There were two alternatives. There was European-style totalitarianism and there was Soviet Bolshevism. Anne Morrow Lindbergh, Charles Lindbergh's wife, wrote an immensely popular book called The Wave of the Future. See if any of this sounds familiar. To her, the wave of the future was not democratic capitalism and all the complications and imperfections of the system that we've been talking about. But it was a strong man in a totalitarian system who could seize, if necessary, the means of production and the means of the media in order to meet the changing challenges of global governance in an increasingly technological and intimate world. That was 1933. As Mark Twain once said, history may not repeat itself, but it does rhyme. <laughs> Roosevelt was determined. Roosevelt once said, the two redeeming features of American life is that we have a sense of hope and a sense of humor. I think it's a profound insight. Roosevelt was determined not to lose the democratic experience, experiment in the midst of this cataclysm. And he knew exactly what the stakes were. That night, his inauguration night, Rex Tugwell, one of his brain trusters, came to him, and rather pretentiously when you think about it. Uh, Roosevelt's having a glass of whiskey and going to bed. And Tugwell says, Mr. President, if you succeed in solving the Depression, you will go down as our greatest president. But if you fail, you'll go down as our worst. And Roosevelt looked at him and said, if I fail, I'll go down as our last. <laughs> he knew. He knew. We came through it by hook and by crook. And in many ways, almost until this last election, I think from 1932 to 2016, American politics can basically be understood as a figurative conversation between Franklin Roosevelt and Ronald Reagan. The two central questions were the relative role of the market in the public sector and the relative projection of power against commonly agreed upon foes. Interestingly, now all that's kind of uh, in, in a Cuisinart. We don't really agree on who the rivals and foes are and parties that one party that used to be against tariffs and walls are now for tariffs and walls. It's just it's kind of a mixed up moment. But there was an unusual period of broad consensus from 32 to 16. And that neither side had a monopoly on virtue or truth 
or common sense. Sometimes one side was more right than the other, and sometimes the other was. But that's the nature of self-government. I'm not someone who believes that the answer is always in the middle. That's the, the road to the Brookings Institution breakfast. That's, that's, that's what that is. You know, there's a reason Warren Rudman was never president. You know, there's just, you know, this idea that, oh, if we could only sit down, we would solve it. Not really. No. We have to do it. Jefferson saw, uh, even while he went into this deep existential tribal struggle against Hamilton, he saw that mutual concessions of opinion, as he put it, mutual concessions of opinion were necessary. But what is politics if not the manufacturing of a consensus for a given period of time to address a certain problem that you know will ultimately recur in, at some eventual point? There's no permanent political solution. Again, there hasn't been since the fall. Not autumn, the fall, capital F, <laughs> uh, the big one. Uh, so I'm not saying that we should lower our expectations. Lord knows we've done that enough. But I am saying that we have to have a more realistic and proportionate view of the possibilities of the public arena. And I think that might lower our blood pressure a little bit. If you realize that everything is provisional, important, but provisional. The issues can be of perennial and unchanging significance. The solutions and our reactions are necessarily tempered by the circumstances of a given season and the possibilities of a given moment. That's what history teaches us. The most ferocious battles, let's, let's just run through some campaigns. So let's think about this. Uh, 1948, four candidates, right? Henry Wallace, Strom Thurmond, Dewey, Truman. Kind of a precursor, really, in many ways. Absolutely ferocious. But we now look back on 1948, 49, 50 as, wow, if we, most people would take that political culture in a heartbeat. But that leads us, doesn't it, to Lincoln's birthday in 1950 in Wheeling, West Virginia, when Joe McCarthy gave a speech saying that there were 205 communists in the Department of State. There were communists in the federal government during the Cold War. Truman had gotten most of them in a loyalty program that drove the left crazy. McCarthy, as uh, Roy Cohn, his lawyer, and Donald Trump's later lawyer, actually said, McCarthy had bought anti-communism the way other people might buy a car. It was the means to an end. McCarthy was just late to the story. And it took four years. Margaret J. Smith of Maine gave a speech called the Declaration of Conscience. And uh, let's see, so McCarthy launches his campaign in February of 50, I think it was uh, May when Senator Smith gave a speech, basically laying out the entire argument against McCarthy. As usual, it took the men about four years to catch up. Uh, McCarthy dismissed, uh, she only got six co-signers, and McCarthy dismissed them as Snow White and the Six Dwarves. But ultimately, in December of 1954, the rest of the Senate sided with where Senator Smith had been in the beginning. But it took four years, and there is still a ferocious debate about how right or how wrong Joe McCarthy was. And as, we've, as I alluded to, even 50 years ago, a half century ago, in 1968, the lifetime of almost everyone here, almost, George Wallace carried 13.5% of the popular vote and five states. He carried five states on an explicitly segregationist platform after the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, after the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. And you can argue all you want about fundamental questions, but it was a matter of settled law and was be attempting to become a matter of custom that we were going to broaden the definition of what Thomas Jefferson had meant when he wrote the most important sentence in the English language. 
that we are all created equal and endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I will say this. I worry sometimes about making hyperbolic claims like the most important sentence in the English language, largely because of the old story about the Texas school board candidate who was against teaching Spanish. And so on the stump said, if English was good enough for our Lord Jesus Christ, it's good enough for Texas. <laughs> so I am careful about that. Um, <laughs> one more Texas story. Uh, I don't know why I got Texas on the brain right now. Um, uh, Joe and I were talking about this earlier. Uh, uh, Jim Baker, uh, Marvel, you know, who got his start in national politics, really, uh, as the delegate hunter for this man right here uh, in 1976. Baker, in 1978, went to run for attorney general of Texas, and he lost, blessedly for all of us, because then he could end the Cold War. Um, if he'd been in Texas politics, he probably would have fought it. Uh, but uh, he loses, and that weekend he's driving out to his ranch to, to lick his wounds, and he stops at a gas station, he's filling up, and an old guy comes up to him and says, anybody ever tell you you look a lot like Jimmy Baker? <laughs> and Baker said, yeah, sometimes. And the guy said, didn't that just piss you off? <laughs> um, not, not really a relevant story, but um, you'll remember it, so that's good. Um, so I, I want to leave you with this. Um, we've talked about the, uh, the Ku Klux Klan in World War I. We've talked about the early 1930s and the fight over the future of democratic capitalism. We've talked about Joe McCarthy. We've talked about George Wallace. There's a theme here, right? The country is shaped by this perennial struggle between a tendency to want to open our arms and a tendency to want to clench a fist. Sometimes clenching a fist is the right thing. Sometimes opening your arms is the wrong thing. But I ask you, wherever you stand on the spectrum, to think about this. And let me know if you think of one. Can you think of a moment, can you think of an era in American history where that you would want to go back to, that you would want to emulate or commemorate, that was about constricting the possibilities of people joining the mainstream by dint of hard work and rising in this capitalistic, democratic world to make their way to follow what Lincoln called to have a fair chance to rise because of our industry, intelligence, and enterprise. August 22nd, 1864, speech at the White House. A fair chance, said we're fighting this war so that you will have a fair chance for your in to rise because of your industry, intelligence, and enterprise. I can't think of a moment, and this is not liberal and conservative in the sense we, we use it, but I can't think of a moment where, you know what, I'd really like to be in that year. And that was a time when we were, and this is a metaphoric sense, building a wall or keeping people at bay. We are standing here in part because the boom of the Second World War, the prosperity that unfolded after 1945, created enormous, mind-boggling opportunity for people who had had no expectation that they would be able to even make a living. This was the Depression generation. One out of four American men were out of work. And by 1955, 1960, no, no place on the globe had ever become as prosperous as quickly. I, I don't think there's any mistake, any coincidence at all that 1964 and 1965 saw the widening of the definition of who we were in the Civil Rights Act, in the Voting Rights Act, those were the two years of the highest per capita American income in history. So people who looked like me suddenly felt secure enough to say, all right, let's, let's drop these unconstitutional borders. So this is not some kind of lefty Trojan horse. 
I, and I'll, I'll leave you with, with, with this. Um, tomorrow represents, coincidentally, the 30th anniversary of Ronald Reagan's farewell address to the country. 30 years. If you want to feel old, which none of us do, but I you know Jamie. Um, can you drive yet, by the way? <laughs> Do they, do they have that? Do, they, do you get a driver when you're a fellow? <laughs> do you? Okay, good, good. Didn't you all think that? It's like, oh, she's like 12. Um, 30 years between now and President Reagan. That's the same amount of time that separated Eisenhower's farewell address from Reagan's. Isn't that terrible? And then if you go back another 30 years, it's the same amount of time from Herbert Hoover becoming president to Eisenhower leaving the White House. It's a terrible game to start playing, I promise. But a Republican president 30 years ago tomorrow said that the point that his vision of a shining city on a hill, which as we all know, city on a hill is a phrase from the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus never said shining city on a hill. One of the great gifts of Ronald Reagan is that he was such a good phrase maker that people now think Jesus said, <laughs> shining city on a hill. I never met President Reagan. It's one of my great regrets. But uh, I did get to know Mrs. Reagan a little bit. And she was the only woman I ever knew who would order a third of a Cobb salad for lunch. Um, and she always knew more gossip than I did, which really was annoying. So she'd say, well, did you hear what Obama said? No. I didn't. And you're 90 years old and living out here. Why, why, why do you know? Uh, but I was talking to her once, and I said, you know, and because I, I had just heard, no kidding, of a preacher in a pulpit say, as our Lord said, we shall be as a shining city on the hills. I was like, God, Reagan's so good. Uh, and I said, you know, one of the things that's remarkable about your husband, ma'am, is President Reagan improved on Jesus. And Nancy said, well, yes, that's the kind of thing Ronnie would do. <laughs> May we all someday be loved as Nancy Davis loved Ronald Reagan. But he's describing the vision of, of the city on a hill. And he talks about how we should be a place where all the pilgrims from all the lost places who are, who are hurtling through the darkness toward home will come to this city and become part of this great experiment. And in that spirit, I think, in that Reagan-esque spirit, that we open our arms, we're bigger hearted than we sometimes think we are. This is not about the politics of the moment. This is about the story of a generation and the story of an age. And as Winston Churchill once said, you can always count on us to do the right thing once we've exhausted every other possibility. <laughs> Thank you. People were so eager to ask questions. I was getting questions in the aisle coming up before you even got started. <laughs> okay, so in your book, Soul of America, you explain that Martin Luther King and, and uh, Lyndon Johnson are having a conversation with each other, and Dr. King is regretting the fact that nobody in America can seem to pay attention to anything for more, yeah. than, for more than 10 days. Well, the question is, how do we get back to where we can pay attention to something for 10 days? <laughs> It, it, it's like Thermopylae. No, um, no, it was. It was at um, that was actually at, at Kennedy's funeral. Uh, King is standing uh, on the street with Walter Fauntroy, and uh, Fauntroy says, "Oh my goodness, uh, you know this is really going to change things. You know the, assass this, the drama of the assassination. Things will be different." And King turns to him and says, "We're a ten-day nation, Walter." And now we're about it, and I'm not big, this is not clever, 10 minutes, right? I mean, it's really hard. And I, I, one of the things I struggle with all the time, I'm sure you do too, if you're here, all right, let's be honest, you watch too much cable news, don't you? <laughs> we're, we're, we're having an intervention, you know? Uh, you all follow this very closely, right? Most folks don't. You know, we have 340 million people. 
the most, we have about, what, 115, 120 who vote in a presidential election. Isn't that about right? Uh, for all the various mathematical reasons. Um, tonight, uh, Hannity and Maddow, and I guess Anderson Cooper, will have, they're the three biggest folks in cable news, their combined audiences maybe 10 million, cumulative. It's a tiny number of people. Now, you know all of them, <laughs> right? And they all talk to each other, and they, they move from seeing it to writing for each other and texting each other and all of that. Um, one of the things we have to figure out, one of the things I always try to figure out is to what extent is what I sometimes think of as the virtual beltway that you're sort of in, in it, even if you're not physically in it. To what extent does that represent the broad reality of, of, of the country? And I think we saw in the 2016 election that it's not always reflective, right? I mean, I, there were, now there, I wish I had a dollar for every person who says, well, you know, I saw this all coming. So, well, if you, if you saw it all coming, you would have bet on it and you wouldn't be talking to me, you'd be on an island somewhere. Uh, so there's a lot of, a lot of retrospective wisdom. Um, as, as you know, here's a fun detail about this, not fun, but two weeks after Dallas, after President Kennedy was killed, Gallup polled, 70% of the country said they'd voted for him. He won by 6,000 votes, most of them manufactured in Chicago. Uh, so we tend to be retrospectively wise. Um, I don't think we've ever been particularly good at sustained attention. The thing that worries me most is, and it's going to get worse, is the propaganda that has been the province of, of Russia and other countries and has been used uh, more and more in American domestic campaigns. That technology is getting better and better. There's something called deep fake. Do you know what that is? You heard that. So deep fake is this technology where there can be a, a, a video manufactured of me saying anything, and you cannot tell the difference. Um, now, I create enough problems for myself. You know, I, I don't need someone in Ukraine doing it. Uh, that's going to get worse. And so there's going to be, we, we will see in this presidential cycle, fake videos, and not like you look at and you say, oh, that's fake. There will be a very sophisticated campaign to discredit people in a highly propagandistic, highly polished propagandistic way. And so what we have to do is become wary consumers of everything we see. Okay, we have uh, a bunch of questions coming in. Here is a very interesting one. It's often been said that we get the citizens in a democracy get the leaders they deserve. Yeah. Do we get the media we deserve? And what would you uh, do to change? We kind of do. Um, first, I, I would resist the word the media now because I don't think it means anything. You, you all, with you, anyone with a telephone, is a member of the media, right? So anyone speaks now at the, with the same possibility of reaching the same number of people or more than Cronkite reached. That, that, that's possible. That is, there is no gatekeeper anymore. So there's now, it's a totally democratized world. On the one hand, that's great. On the other hand, you know, with power comes responsibility. And so people tend to, one of the things I tell my kids is never write anything online that you wouldn't be willing to say to the person to their face. And that means no one's going to post anything. Uh, and I think that th that media, the political wild, uh, wild west, is now as much a part of what we would think of as the traditional media. Now, the reporting press, the reporting institutions, are they what we deserve? Um, in a way, yes, because it's largely driven by economics. The One of the things that the internet, we're now about 22 years into this in the news business, the internet incentivizes and rewards three things, speed, predictability, and hyperbole. 
right? Very, a lot of you all will say, you know, I want to know where to go to just get information. If everybody who said they wanted that wanted that, more people would watch the news hour. It's actually really seductive to watch the partisan press. It's the reason f more people watch the president on Fox, Fox News, uh, the other night than watched them on any of the networks. And just as a mathematical thing, that's hard to do. But it means that the base is there, they're excited, they, and they wanted to see that in a congenial home team locker room. All right? I am on MSNBC and NBC for many, many years. There were about 250,000 or so viewers of the shows I was on. And I met all of them in Southwest Airline <laughs> flight. Those numbers are exponentially higher now. Defeat is really good for the opposition. Uh, and people, I, I, I run into people and I, I want to grab them, but they will say, you know, I turn on Morning Joe and I don't turn it off until after Brian Williams. I'm like, you really, really need to see someone. Um, uh, but there are a lot of people who, and, and it's absorbing, and it's in many ways the most fascinating political moment since Watergate, unquestionably. But the, we do need to find, and it's the reason I make this argument, we do need to find a, a, a sense of proportion. Uh, the, you're never going to put the genie back in the bottle. The reason the media, the, uh, the part, reason for the partisan media is the rise of cable, the elimination of the fairness doctrine in the middle of the Reagan years, which used to mean that if you were on radio or TV and you went into a political subject, you had to give both sides. Uh, that was lifted as part of a generalized deregulation move in 86. Uh, talk radio goes AM, talk radio goes Limbaugh. So it was lifted in 86. Limbaugh becomes big and goes national in 88. Uh, Fox News is founded in 96. And Basically, the economic model is you don't do, on the one hand, on the other hand, you give people what they want. This is a question actually from one of our Cook Leadership Academy fellows. So the conversation between FDR and Reagan lasted essentially until 2016, a debate yeah. between these two great views of the world. And now it seems to be suspended or in abeyance. Or it's, it's, changed a lot. What do you think, how do you get at the change itself, and how do we get back to a debate about American fundamentals the way Roosevelt and Reagan would have framed them? Well, it's driven by, the, the initial conversation was driven by crisis, right? So the depression, the, the, the perils of the depression, the wages of isolationism uh, from the 20s and into the 30s created this more center-left activist world that almost immediately had a balance. I mean, that one of the reasons I, I talk about it in, in, this, in these terms is there's this sense, particularly among left-leaning historians, that there was an American consensus until Reagan, and that Reagan somehow was this sharp right turn. I think that totally misunderstands the nature of the country. Uh, there's always been this dialectic, this give, give and take. And the other thing about Franklin Roosevelt, and you all appreciate this here, 43% uh, of the country never voted for him. Uh, he was, there were a couple of very close presidential elections for him. 40% of the country, let's call, it, let's call it 35, couldn't say his name. Remember, they called him that man. There's a wonderful uh, uh, anecdote, revealing anecdote, in one of Jeff Ward's, Jeffrey Ward, a uh, great Roosevelt biographer, writes most of Ken Burns' stuff. So you, you hear you, Jeff's words are in your head, even if you don't know it. Uh, about a woman who, in the middle of the 1960s, she'd been born in 1940. And she remembered one of the central moments of her childhood was she remembered her parents' VE Day barbecue. It was somewhere in the Midwest, I can't remember where. And she remembered the bonfire and people dancing and being so happy. 
So about 1965 or so, she's trying to sort of talk about her childhood. She asks her mother, she says, how did that happen? How did, was it a planned barbecue? Did, I mean, how did the neighbors come together? Just sort of a putting a story together. And her mother looked at her and said, oh no, dear, that wasn't VE day. That was the day Roosevelt died and we were celebrating. So there's, there was plenty of pushback, right? Uh, movement conservatism in many ways developed because Eisenhower had proven to be, to Bill Buckley and to Bill Rusher and others, had proven to be too accommodationist with the New Deal. And so you, you, you've had this push and pull forever. The great moments of this conversation were dictated by crisis. So by the Depression, by the Cold War, and then by the genuine, we forget now, the genuine crisis of confidence in the country in the late 1970s, when people thought the presidency was too big for one person, and, and then along comes Reagan, and it seems everything's sort of put back together. And I don't want to over, overly Fortin Bross him, but that's kind of what happened, uh, even in real time. The way to get back to it is, I think, just to find, and I would think this, and other people may disagree, would surely disagree. I, it's, it's not that the president is not making arguments that are legitimate. It's that he makes a series of arguments that don't traditionally come from the same person. <laughs> right? No, it's just true. I mean, that's a historical fact, right? Um, Republicans were not for tariffs. Republicans were not against free trade. NAFTA was negotiated by the first time George H.W. Bush went back to the White House in 1993. He was with President Ford and President Carter and President Clinton talking about NAFTA. Ronald Reagan was one of the chief architects of NAFTA. At that point, he wasn't able to, to do this sort of thing. So there was this, again, th that's sort of the coherent position. Now, the reason he's president now is because a lot of people believe that deal was the creation of an establishment embodied by the people I just mentioned that was not delivering for the people. Totally legitimate argument. And he's president of the United States, not least because of it. But that doesn't mean that it's still, that, it's a co that there's a coherent movement behind that. That, that, that. That's a protest, not a policy, it seems to me. Okay. Then uh, what about the next president you want to write about and why? I got some moves and ahs. Yeah, that's good. Um, I think Oprah is going to be great. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> totally a joke. Um, I will say this. Uh, I saw her on TV a year or two ago, and she said, you know, I used to think I didn't know enough to be president. Now, eh. uh, <laughs> It's a good line. Um, I'm doing James and Dolly Madison. Uh, my goal is to make you interested in James Madison. I didn't say it was going to be easy. Uh, I, I think Madison is the one of the found, the most important founder that you can't actually imagine what it'd be like to have dinner with him. You know, I think you can think about Jefferson, you can Hamilton, uh, Washington would be kind of boring, but you at least know what it'd be like. Uh, Adams uh, would be complaining about Jefferson. Uh, <laughs> And so uh, I, wa I want to bring Madison back. I think if you write the Constitution, if you drive the opposition party out of business, if you fight the ratifying war of American history, uh, you deserve to, to be better remembered. So that, that's my goal. Enlightening and entertaining. Thanks, John Meacham. Thank you. You can introduce yourself. Thank you. I'm Joe Calvarusi, the executive director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, you've enriched our lives. Thanks for coming to Michigan in January. And the uh, <laughs> wonderful books you write and the lectures you do, we very much appreciate the uh, Grand Rapids. Let's give them another round of applause.
Uh, not many people know in this room, but John played a very special role in the pre-commissioning activities of the commissioning of the Gerald R. Ford uh, aircraft carrier named after President Ford. Thank you for uh, your involvement. I echo Scott's comments. Uh, what a wonderful relationship we have between the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation, uh, the museum, and the Howland Science Center. Thank you so much. It's this partnership uh, that allows us to do things we couldn't do to remember Ralph Hounstein and President Ford and Mrs. Ford and uh, bring speakers like John to, uh, to our community. And thanks for everybody coming in this room. If it wasn't for support like this, we couldn't put on programs like this and we couldn't do it without your financial support to both the Hounstein Center and the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation. We'll see you in a couple of weeks for HW Brands. I know John talked about it. Uh, February 7th, it's going to be back in this room. It's going to be a night program. I think there's marketing material that's going out soon. And thank you so much for coming and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.